Hello and welcome back to another video with It's Dr. Dan and today we're going to be learning about calorimetry. Meaning that what this is, is this is used to measure heat changes in both physical and chemical changes. So what this, what this utilizes is generally we try to try to figure out how much heat is being absorbed or released during a chemical reaction. So it's very common in your chemistry course where you might have to use a coffee cup calorimeter like the one I drew here, where essentially on the inside you'll have all kinds of different chemicals maybe mixed together, maybe chemicals mixed with water, maybe you'll drop something into it and see how much heat is being transferred. And it gives, a for a very cheap method, it actually gives very accurate results in determining a lot of the information about a reaction, especially if we want to figure out, let's say if it's exothermic or endothermic. Now, the coffee cup calorimeter is a really cheap way, but it does give decent results. Now, why do we care about calorimetry? Well, it's mainly for everybody that's interested in nutrition out there and trying to figure out exactly where the calories on the labels of our different foods come from. Well, generally, there's a very more sophisticated version of it, like a bomb calorimeter, uh, which is the name of it, where they actually essentially kind of make your food, your food sort of explode and burn it. To figure out how much energy is stored within the chemical bonds there, so how much chemical energy they're being stored. So essentially, they'll use um, uh, try to if we have all these different conversions here that are very useful. I would write them down. Um, we're essentially one cal, so big C, is equal to one thousand calories with a little. C. So I try to color code that they are different from each other. There's big and little, um, being that welcome to the imperial system. <laughs> And then one large C calorie is equal to one kilocal and 4.184 joules, which is essentially based on a specific heat of water, is equal to one calorie little c, or 4.184 kilojoules is equal to one calorie big c. So now when it comes to all these different energies, we can break them down and like go to different food types, so like carbs, fats, and proteins, which are major macromolecules that we ingest. You can see like fats have the most energy within them. So this is the reason why it takes a, you know, it's good to have fats for energy consumption, but it takes a lot to break them down. And what happens, you get a lot of energy, but usually they're stored for later. Um, things like proteins are usually, you know, it's better for developing muscle and carbs are quick burning. So they all have their own different types of energy values to them. So what we're going to be doing in this particular video is looking at the different ways we as a calorimeter, which will go off a lot of lab-based examples. Remember, before going through anything, is what specific heat is all about. So we're going to be looking at the specific heat capacity. Now, what that is, just as a reminder, is the amount of heat that is required Increase the temperature by one degree. So this is for every gram of substance. So when we are using this, right, it's I call this the MCAT equation because I like to think of all the pre-meds out there that need to use this. Where essentially we have heat, which is joules, and this is equal to our mass, which is in grams, times specific heat, which has its own kind of special unit of joules over grams by Celsius altogether, that's not a formula, it's, it's the derived unit for it, multiplied by the change in temperature, which is TF minus TI, so final minus initial, and that's in degrees Celsius. Okay? Now, this can also be used for as, with calories as well, so you could have calories over grams by Celsius too. Um, just keep in mind the heat would be calories. Now, when this is happening, keep in mind, energy must be conserved. So this is all about seeing how the system and the surroundings are interacting with one another. So for all these problems, the system is our chemical reaction in this case. And then our surroundings is it's the, it's the solution that is being here that is being used here. OK, so like water, for example, is considered to be the solution. Um, usually a lot of times when you see the letters like AQ written next to a, um, a chemical compound that's letting you know, hey, this is made in water, the surroundings of the water, of the, uh, the surroundings in this case is water or your solution. 
um, system, it, a system in this case, so to say it again, right, is the chemical reaction. Now, why do we care about that? Well, remember, energy is conserved, meaning it's transferred from one to the other. So if all the molecules are reacting, they're kind of all bonding together, breaking apart, doing their thing, well, all that energy, it has to get transferred to the surroundings. And that's what we're going to be measuring with a thermometer in this case. So instead of using system surroundings, we're going to redefine that to say, oh, reaction and solution. And being that it is conserved, we can set this term equal to zero and kind of also rearrange it a little bit for our own purposes. So if I kind of like take this guy down here and copy and paste it being that's equal to zero we can actually move things around and say hey this is going to be equal to where one of these is the negative value equal to the positive of the other one so keep in mind that the signs will be opposite of one another and this is what's going to allow you to tell if something's exo or endothermic so what we're going to be looking at is whatever the sign is of the reaction tells you endo versus exo. So the sign being positive for endo and negative for exo. So depending on if the temperature goes up or down, we'll actually have an effect on that. All right, let's take a look at some of the different problems and how we can actually solve for these. Um, so if I have the following, it says 10 milliliters of sodium hydroxide with a density of 1.21 grams per milliliter is mixed with 40 ml of water, the density of one gram per milliliter. Your initial temperature of the solution is 17.2 degrees Celsius, and it is raised to 57.1 degrees Celsius. Assume a specific heat of 4.184 joules per grams per Celsius. Calculate the Q. Oh, that's a lot. How do you do that? All right, the first thing is what we're going to do is we're going to highlight our values. So we have 10 mL of sodium hydroxide with its density, and then you also have 40 mL of water with its density. Now, why do we care about these two? Well, in order to use the MCAT equation, so one thing that I didn't mention before is the mass portion of it. So the M is the total mass of everything mixed together so total mass of solution meaning it's the small portion and the big portion all of it added together so all the things you mix together so with being especially when they're the same base so they're both liquids we're going to add them together we're going to add them together all right what else do we have in the problem we also have two temperatures we have 17.2 degrees celsius and we also have 57.1 degrees Celsius, and then the specific heat. So let's kind of write down all these things that we got. Let's start with the masses. So we had 10 milliliters of sodium hydroxide, and we need to convert that to grams for ourselves. So 10, milligram, 10 uh, milliliters, we're going to use the density that was defined earlier. And that's going to convert to that value. So our units cancel. And what we will get from there is we're going to get 12.1 um, grams of sodium hydroxide. And then we're going to add that to the mass of water, which, as you can see from earlier, we had 40 ml of water and it has a density of one. So that's a one to one ratio there. So 40 grams of water is equal to 40 milliliters of water. So let's add that up. So 12.1 grams plus 40.0 grams of water. And we're going to have a total mass of 52.1 grams. So now what we're going to be doing is, is essentially taking our mass, timesing it by our C and our delta T value. So we have our Q of our surroundings, our Q of our solution. It's equal to the mass, which is 52.1 grams. We're going to times that by C, which is 4.184 joules over grams by Celsius. And then we're going to multiply that by the change in temperature. So our temperature was 57.1 as a final temperature and 17.2 as an initial. So delta T is equal to final minus 
goals. So we'll write that down for ourselves. So we had a 57.1 minus 17.2 degrees. All right, so now is that all of our piece of information? It looks like it. So we're going to take all of that together, multiply everything, and what we're going to get after multiplying 52.1 times 4.184 times parentheses 57.1 minus 17.2, we're going to get 8,697.7 joules, which we are going to round to three significant figures. In order to to, dem to show that properly, we're going to have to put that in scientific notation or put it as kilojoules, one or the other, okay? So this should be your answer for this portion of the problem. Now I have a follow-up version of essentially, well, what is the key of the reaction? And what exactly does that mean? Well, the one above here was the key of the solution. So meaning that if we think of system and surroundings, well, this part on the inside of the box is reaction. What you have outside is your solution. So how exactly do those two equal? Well, remember, Q of the reaction is equal to, what well, if one of them is negative, the other one's positive, Q of the solution. So being that we have for one value is 8,070 point times 10 to negative third, it's going to be the opposite sign. So our Q of reaction is going to be negative 8,000 or 8,700 joules or 8.70 kilojoules, meaning that this is going to be an exothermic reaction. Okay, So that's what that sign means, is that it tells you whether or not it's exothermic or endothermic for its final. So they're opposites of one another. First part was positive. The second part is negative because they are equal but opposite signs. Because remember, energy must be conserved. So this is one problem that we can see. Let's take a look at if we want to transfer heat from, let's say, a hot object to water. All right, so let's break down another word problem, which is a very com common lab example that you may have seen or will see in introductory chemistry. So one thing that we can commonly do is we can see how heat transfers from one object to another, meaning that if we assume a closed system where essentially any energy that's stored within the system can be transferred to the colder object, we can actually find out a lot of the information here. So one thing we have with this heat transfer problem is essentially what is it? So let's go through it, and I made it a long one kind of on purpose so you can kind of see how, how, how it is that we break this down. So step by step, you find an unknown piece of metal sitting in a drawer at home. You decide you want to apply what you learned in chemistry class to determine its identity. Okay, so what you do is you heat up the piece of metal to an initial temperature of about 102.3 degrees. Okay, so this is for the metal is what this information is for. So you know what, I'm gonna color code this to be red for metal. Now, what it says next, you measure out 50 grams of water with an initial temperature of 20.1 degrees. Okay, so these are both for the actual block for the water itself. So now it says you carefully drop a hot piece of metal into the water. Okay, so what do you think is going to happen if that, if that occurs? So if you were to drop something very hot to water, it's going to cool it down, right? It's going to transfer that heat to the water. So it's kind of think of that stereotypical blacksmith scene where you see like steam and all kinds of stuff coming up. It's sort of like that. Now, when that happens, the heat is transferred. And what it's going to do, it's going to, both of them are going to reach a final temperature at 26.3 degrees. So they're both going to get to the same final temperature. Okay. So we have all kinds of little piece of information that we are kind of getting here that we want to kind of label and to see how can we do this and understand what we have. Okay, now once essentially it cools down, you measure the mass of your metal and you determine it's 19 grams on the dot. Now it says water has a specific heat of 4.184 joules per grams by Celsius. Find the specific heat and determine its identity. Okay, and I list a bunch of little specific heats over here in the corner for us. 
to figure out what we think it could be based on how it looks. So we drop that in and we want to figure it out. Now, how do we do that? Well, the first thing is, is remembering system, the negative of the system is equal to the surrounding, meaning that the negative heat of the metal is equal to the heat of water should be perfectly transferred. Now, what can we do from there? Well, both these are Q's, meaning that they're both MCAT equations. So what we're going to actually do is we're going to plug in the MCAT equation for both of them, set them equal to each other. So what are we trying to solve for is we are looking for the C of the metal, which is over here. So what we're going to do is we're going to simply do a little bit of algebra for ourselves and move some things around. So what we'll do is we'll divide both sides by the variables we know, which is essentially the... Um, temperature of the metal, right? You know that value. So we'll copy that on both sides. We'll divide, divide it. And we also know our mass of the metal as well, because we read that earlier in the problem. So now when that happens, it all cancels out on left-hand side as a result. So this goes away, and this goes away, and it gives us a new equation that we can essentially use as like a plug-and-play equation for ourselves solve for the specific heat of the metal. Okay, so this would be C of our metal here. So let's take all the values that we had from earlier and plug them in. So now that we have our C of the metal, that's going to be equal to our mass of water, so which was 50 grams. We'll times that by the specific heat of water, which is 4.184 joules, grams, Celsius. Multiply that by the final minus the initial, which the final value was about 26.3 degrees for both of them. 26.3 degrees, and that's minus 20.1, I believe. So this is what's going in the top of the denominator of the new of for the numerator. Then on the bottom is the mass of the metal, which was 19 grams. And while you're doing this, you want to be really organized as much as possible. A negative symbol out front, and its final, te its initial temperature was 102.3 degrees C, and it also reached 26.3 degrees C. So once we plug in all this into our calculator, what we'll do is we'll multiply the top, so 50 times 4.184 times 26.3 minus 20.1, and divide all that by negative 19.1, uh, or sorry, 19.0 times 26.3 minus 102.3. And what you're going to see is this is going to make a negative value over here in the temperatures, and it's going to cancel out the negative on the far um, when that happens. Okay, so when we plug all these values in, we are going to get about 0 0.898 joules over grams by C. Now, how do we get those values? Well, if we kind of look really, really closely, essentially the Celsius will cancel out over here, and the grams are going to cancel out on the left. So the only thing that's going to be left is the C units all the way over here on the far side. So our specific heat of our metal is about 0.898. So let's look, let's see if we can match it to something. And what we're going to see is that our aluminum, which is about 8.9 or 0.897, is really close. So being that these are intrinsic properties or intensive properties, our bar is made of aluminum. And this is how you can do this kind of problem. So if you have to work up any of your lab data or try to understand little things in class, this is one of the harder problems that you have. So generally, these aren't usually seen on introductory general chemistry exams. But in homework and in labs, it's more common being that you have more time. Um, for general chemistry one, this is a problem that could easily be for an exam. That level is a little bit uh, harder. So try to make sure you know it's just setting those MCAT equations equal to each other. All right. Thank you so much for listening. And I will see you later. Bye now.